Okay, uh, we'll, we'll make a start now. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I uh, have to tell you that this session is being recorded. So if uh, you're not okay with that, uh, you might want to leave right now. Of course, this is to, to make uh, uh, the, um, the recording available later on to, to all of you and to others who couldn't be present. Uh, so thank you very much for your attendance to this uh, media briefing. I'm, I'm Gonçalo Carvalho. I'm from one of the NGOs who is hosting uh, this online event, which will be the launch of a joint paper on EU marine biodiversity by a nice coalition of NGOs. Um, this paper presents how key marine policy gaps in the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 can be overcome. Uh, and puts forward the NGO's recommendations for areas of improvement uh, uh, in many documents, but par particularly in the EU Parliament's uh, own initiative report on biodiversity strategy, which, which was presented this afternoon. Um, so, as you all know, uh, all life on the planet came from the ocean, uh, and on life, all life on the planet depends on the ocean. Without an healthy and functioning ecosystem, uh, marine ecosystem, life would be unbearable. Um, we need uh, to help it in a way in order to help ourselves. Um, and, and we all know that EU seas are feeling the heat, let's say. Uh, the member states have failed to achieve the good environmental status for our seas and, our, and the combined impacts uh, are on a path uh, to cross complex planetary, planetary boundaries, which we don't even fully understand. Uh, but we know that this might trigger irreversible changes to the ecological conditions under which uh, humanity has evolved and thrived. Uh, President von der Leyen and many EU uh, heads of state uh, or governments have joined the Leaders' Pledge, pledge for Nature in, in the UN Summit on Biodiversity, committing themselves to reverse the biodiversity lo loss by 2030. The European Commission's biodiversity strategy is a blueprint for delivering on that pledge. Um, these and other high-level documents and agreements all set an intention to transform uh, the way we do things in order to save life on the planet. But we do need more than promises. Uh, the Back to the Source document, which we'll present this afternoon, is a toolkit of 10 ocean-related actions that the EU decision makers, including the Commission, the Member States, and the MEPs can use to translate the biodiversity strategy and other commitments into tangible and binding action. Um, so we will now have uh, presentations from representatives of five of the NGOs that put together this paper. And they will reveal a bit more uh, of the detail of some of the sections that uh, make up this document. Uh, after that, uh, these, these presentations will be five minutes each. After that, we will open the floor uh, for questions, uh, especially to our, our journalists uh, audience, which, uh, which are attending today. Uh, in the meantime, you can write your questions on the Q&A uh, chat box so that our speakers can start thinking of the response. Otherwise, uh, we, we will start a, a Q&A um, open process where you can turn on your mic and your video and put your question directly. So with no further delay, I'll give the floor to Rebecca Hubbard from Our Fish, who will be our first presenter this afternoon. Beck, if you may. Hello and good afternoon. Sorry, I have two presentations that I am just going to share. So I won't be a moment. One second. Excellent. So, um, moving that to the right view. So, I will just be speaking. You can see my front screen now, right? Uh, my title page. I'll be talking about the um, the opportunity and, in fact, the need to save Europe's biodiversity and maximize climate and ecosystem benefits of fisheries. Please let me know, Gonzalo, if you're not seeing the right slides. <laughs> 
So the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 includes a commitment to develop an action plan to protect marine ecosystems and fisheries resources in 2021. This action plan provides a long overdue opportunity to address the broad scale impacts of destructive fishing and overfishing and, it strength, and to strengthen the ocean's capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change. As the IPBES uh, reported uh, last year, fishing is the largest impact of marine, on marine biodiversity. And so we must manage it in a way that reflects this impact and decreases it for all species. As Gonzalo rightly pointed out, of course, the ocean is fundamental to life on earth. So protecting marine biodiversity is fundamental and should be a major focus for the EU biodiversity strategy. The action plan must highlight the need for fisheries management to now focus on allowing fish populations to be restored to and maintained at healthy levels that will enable fish to, uh, to perform their, the uh, ecosystem services uh, and marine ecosystems, sorry, ecosystem services that they that are critical for for life on the planet and and for humans, and to ensure that marine species and habitats are healthy and thriving. For too long, the approach has been just to maximise extraction, regardless of the cost. And so, the biodiversity strategy and indeed this action plan specifically provide an opportunity to change that focus. Strong support from the EU Parliament is also very important for this action plan to ensure that it supports productive, resilient fisheries in the future. So we have a couple of key elements which should be incorporated into this action plan and should be reflected uh, within uh, the EU report as well. So one of the key things which isn't currently existing in EU policy and legislation are uh, precautionary buffers for climate change when setting fishing limits. Um, additionally, environmental impact assessments of fishing activities is a key opportunity. And in fact, really, when you look at environmental impact assessments of other activities, they're required for most activities. And considering that fishing is the biggest impact on marine biodiversity, the fact that we don't have them is really a, a clear problem. These impact assessments can and need to look at the impact on food webs, on non-target species and protected species, physical disturbance, like on habitats and seafloor, and also on the capacity of these marine environments and marine ecosystems to mitigate and adapt to climate change, such as carbon rich habitats, coastal protection, but also on the fish populations themselves. The action plan should also include uh, increased measures to minimize bycatch, clear and transparent set of environmental and social criteria for allocating fish quota and a drastic improvement in control, in the control, monitoring and control of fishing activities, because as we all know, there are serious concerns around uh, data, uh, the full documentation of, of fishing uh, catches and impacts. So some of these things are new and some build on existing commitments that haven't been delivered Definitely one of the EU's outstanding barriers to protecting marine biodiversity is its fa failure to implement existing laws. In closing, the 2030 biodiversity strategy can only be successful if it ensures a doubling down on implementation of existing laws and further strengthens these by drastically improving the ocean's capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And that is my presentation. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Beck. Uh, we will now have uh, Andrea Ripple from Seas at Risk. Andrea, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. Let me share my screen. Wait, uh, 
share screen here, share. Okay, can you see it? Right? Yes. yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Ripoll from CIS at Risk, and I'm going to explain how fisheries impacts on sensitive species and harmful fisheries subsidies should be tackled under the strategy for biodiversity 2030. Um, the main impact of fisheries on sensitive species is its bycatch, which is the incidental catch of animals in fishing nets and fishing gear. One of the, the, the recognized globally main threat for many uh, species that are endangered in around the world is bycatch. And we are talking about marine mammals, turtles, sharks, or, or seabirds. Here we have uh, some of the statistics we count with. Um, every year, more than 200,000 seabirds die as bycatch in European waters or that every winter over 10,000 common dolphins die in fishing nets over a three month period in the Bay of Biscay only. This is to have a, an overview of the scale of the problem. And these numbers are only actually estimates because the current data we count with about the scale of the problem is either inadequate, inadequate or directly lacking. So in order to properly solve the problem of bycatch of sensitive species in the EU, we need not only mitigation measures in place in the fishing gear, but also monitoring and data collection programs uh, in, in terms of what is the relation between the species, the sensitive species and the fisheries activity. Um, this is a problem that has been recognized in the European Commission communication on the biodiversity strategy and also in the draft report from the parliament because there is uh, a commitment to, to tackle this problem and to minimize and where possible eliminate bycatch. However, there is no clear plan. And for us, this is worrying because it sounds a bit like the status quo as we have had for decades, um, a lot of uh, regulations and legal requirements for member states to implement these measures to prevent and to end the problem of bycatch of sensitive species and very little has been done. Here, for example, in this table, we can see uh, all the member states that didn't put in place the right measures to mitigate cetacean bycatch under the Habitats Directive and, and, and under the cetacean regulation. So for us, what we are proposing is that um, the issue of bycatch is tackled under the fisheries action plan that is proposed by the commission in, in their communication in the way that there is a development of a set of common rules that is applied across all sea basins equally and it's not just leaving it up to member states to implement the usual or the regular legislation that they have been having to date and it's more it's more centralized let's say like that and this plan should be including um, robust long-term monitoring of the sensitive species status, adequate data collection of the interactions between the fisheries activity and the species, and also the application of the right measures to prevent and mitigate the bycatch. Then in terms of fisheries subsidies, this is also a, an issue that needs to be uh, addressed under the strategy and it is indeed kind of addressed. Um, because without uh, the right financial support, we cannot really have sustainable fisheries or a healthy ocean. So this is something already, already widely recognized internationally as per the Sustainable Development Goal Commitment 14.6, where global leaders committed to end harmful fisheries subsidies by 2020. We have not really uh, met this objective yet. And what we have seen in the proposal of the commission is a vague commitment to keep on promising and hoping to end harmful fisheries subsidies, but not really with a clear plan again. And in the case of the European Parliament, we see that they go even a step further and they plan a phase out of these harmful subsidies by 2030, which for us, this is totally not ambitious enough if we take into account that by 2020, by last year, we should have um, achieve this objective and now we are postponing it again 10 years till 2030. So for us NGOs this is a, a red flag and in order to match the policies that the European Commission is promising under the European Green Deal they really need the proper financial support 
And what they need to do is to ensure that no harmful subsidies are um, in the, as a matter of urgency, in the European Maritime Fisheries Fund that is now being revised in the state aid guidelines as well, that is uh, with an upcoming revision. And also uh, the fuel tax exemption that is granted to the fishing sector should be removed in the upcoming revision of the energy taxation directive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Right on the mark. Uh, next, we have Nicola Fournier from Oceana. Nico, the floor is yours. You can see your presentation. You can turn on your camera as well. We cannot hear you, Nick. Can you see me and hear me now? Yes. Great. Please go ahead. All right. Um, can, you can see my presentation, great. So I'm Nicolas Fournier, I'm working for um, Oceana, I'm the campaign director, um, and I'll be discussing the priorities in the context of our joint position paper, specifically on the issue of protecting um, marine habitats and marine protected areas, and as well as uh, tackling uh, bottom trawling in Europe. So while the European uh, biodiversity strategy and its marine targets um, are welcomed by the NGOs and currently uh, in discussion in the European Parliament, we believe that the Parliament um, can and must further strengthen the ambition because we need to have binding targets to support an effective delivery of uh, marine conservation that supports also resilient and healthy oceans and sustain the people that depends on it. So we specifically um, request um, the Parliament to support this um, ambitious target of protecting one third of all marine areas, both in the EU and uh, internationally. So we want to really um, support this 30% um, by having dedicated wording on um, adding strict protection, which is fully or highly protection. So we're creating effective sanctuaries to protect marine life at sea. We also want the European Commission, the European Commission yes, to champion um, this ambition internationally. So we'll have negotiation that will start at the UN level at the end of the year. And um, the minimum requirement is 30%, which is recommended by, by science. It's been already supported by a number of pledges. So we've mentioned earlier the, the leaders pledge for nature or earlier this uh, week, there was the One Planet Summit where a number of countries have committed to support this 30%. Um, so it's good news, but um, in order to achieve this, um, there are a number of countries that we need to convince internationally. So we need the Commission and the European Union to be strong. And the last point is also to expand that uh, ambition to the high seas. So we want uh, the areas beyond national jurisdiction to also be covered, in particular um, by the, uh, the completion of the negotiation of the new Global Ocean Treaty. Now putting a specific um, um, focus on the impact of bottom trawling, it's the most dest destructing um, fishing gear and it's widely used in Europe. We often refer to it as a bulldozer of the oceans. It destroys, as you can see on this illustration, all um, habitats, you know, corals, sponges, shellfish, it's very highly um, unselective. So a lot of studies have shown today that most of the European marine protected areas are just paper parks. Actually, about 60% of them experience bottom trawling inside them. And we consider this to be incompatible um, with international standards for protection. So we call on a strict prohibition of the most destructive um, activities in NPAs and in particular bottom trawling. At the same time, um, there's also another important area which is overlooked, which is the, the coastal areas. The most, it's the most productive part of our oceans. That's where we have sensitive habitats, uh, fish nurseries, but it's also um, a part of the sea where there is a high concentration of um, pressures and usage. The um, environmental, European Environmental Agency last year uh, published a report showing that about 79% of the coastal seabed was disturbed physically by bottom trawling. So we're calling um, on this um, strategy to also tackle this problem in the, in the coastal areas by creating um, restrictions in the near shore and coastal waters uh, to protect sensitive habitats. And also a number of countries in the world, such as uh, Brazil or Hong Kong or Sri Lanka or 
in Belize have taken those decisions to ban bottom trawling. It's um, it, from part, part of their EZ or even the entire EZ. So we're really looking for um, inspiration globally to push European countries to adopt the similar standards. Thanks a lot. Merci, Nicola. Thank you very much. You were really on time. Um, next, we have Eleonora Panella from IFO. Ele, please, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. Good morning and good afternoon. Depends where are you. Uh, okay, so my colleagues have been talking before on the different thread that they are aff affecting the oceans and the possibility and the chance that we have right now, of course, to try to revert a bit the trend and make it clear that, of course, as it said in our briefing, biodiversity starts from the oceans. One factor, one sector that, of course, is relevant when we're talking about the health of the ocean is definitely shipping, because it's, it's a big, one of the main transport, uh, transport sector. Uh, it has been growing extensively in the past years and, of course, as a direct impact on the health of the oceans. When we think about shipping sector immediately, we collect connected with greenhouse gases and emissions, which of course are affecting the, the environment around us. But most of us, they tend to not to know what's happening below the surface. So what the actually some vessels produce, which is underwater noise, which is invisible to our eye, but of course, as an extremely important impact to the welfare of cetaceans, but also other marine creatures. So th this is why it is very important, and we welcome the fact that was mentioned in the biodiversity strategy itself uh, that needs to be addressed now and forever and for good, because it's one of those pollutants that once the speed of the vessels is reduced, can really go away, can fade out differently from other type of pollution like plastic and so on that needs much bigger and stronger initiative to make sure, which are of course needed, to make sure that they go away. So it can be very fastly addressed. But nevertheless, from 2008, we have in place a directive, which is called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, where government were required to address underwater noise, among other <clears throat> factors, disturbing the, the good environmental status of the oceans. Member states were supposed to actually achieved by 2020, so last year, which we all remember forever as the worst year of the century, but actually this hasn't been achieved. So in order to make sure that this is actually uh, addressed, we need to take a, a, a resolution and to take strong measures now, because as I was saying, of course, uh, the problem is it's very big and concerning, especially for cetaceans, because, uh, for instance, whales can get really lost if there are like underwater noise from shipping, uh, especially, but also from other type of uh, uh, marine uh, factors. But, but and also, it is important to notice that the, basically there is only a small, only a small proportion of, of ships contribute more for most of the noise that is created in, uh, in the oceans. And those are the older ships that then, then have proper propellers. So the propeller is basically this uh, structure in the ship that makes the ship moving. And with the, 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 the movement of the cavitational moving, movement cre creates the noise that actually are affecting uh, the, the animals, in this case, as I was saying, cetaceans. So it is a problem, it can be addressed, and that's why we hope that within the biodiversity strategy, and hopefully sooner than 2030, the, the, the issue can be addressed. There are several measures that have been discussed already in the past, so not only at the, environment, at the European level with MSFD, but also at the IMO level, which is the International Maritime Sa uh, Organization, and their guideline that every party should have taken into account since 2014, but unfortunately they haven't been. 
But at the same time, not only party and government should take their appropriate measure to decrease the noise the, and the speed so, of, their flat, of their vessels, but also industry should start building proper ships that are more silent and, have, uh, and agree to reduce the speed in sensitive areas where there is more passage of, of cetaceans and also other species, that, um, other marine species. So the measures are there, the, the means are there, the knowledge is, is there, it just there's a lack of willingness and starting to take it in real consideration. Thank you. Grazie mille, Ele. <laughs> um, last but not least, uh, we have Matthew Gianni from the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Thank you, Before Gonzalo. Go yeah, can you hear me okay? Good, thanks. Yeah, my name is Matthew Gianni. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm with the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, a coalition of organizations uh, from around the world working since 2004 on the effective conservation of the deep sea. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'll just give a kind of a, a brief overview of two of the key issues that we're working on in relation to the biodiversity strategy. Uh, but first to say effective biodiversity conservation cannot be achieved without doing so in the ocean as well as on land. I mean, we know the oceans cover about 70% of the planet and the deep sea, the area of the ocean below 200 meters depth represents about 90% of the inhabitable biosphere planet-wide. The diversity of species in the oceans may rival that of tropical forests, but scientists estimate that most of the species in the deep sea have not yet been discovered. Uh, deep sea ecosystems are characterized by long-lived, low fecundity species, meaning species that reproduce only very slowly and in low numbers, and thus are particularly vulnerable to human impacts. And already the deep sea is under threat from climate change impacts such as acidification, deoxygenation, etc., pollution and plastics, and deep sea fishing, in particular deep sea bottom trawling. Um, deep sea bed mining is an up and coming threat. And I'll speak about the latter two issues, deep sea fishing and deep sea mining, which are directly related to the biodiversity strategy and the hearing that, we, uh, that, that took place or the, 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 the committee meeting uh, that took place today. But first, the good news. In regard to deep sea fisheries, legislation is already in place to manage deep sea fisheries to prevent damage to so-called vulnerable marine ecosystems, such as uh, cold water corals, which are sometimes referred to as the old growth forests of the sea. And you've heard mention of the old, old growth forests needing protected protection on land in the hearing in the in the in the meeting today at the Envy Committee, and the same uh, really does, does need to be, apply uh, in the deep sea. Um, these areas uh, are recognized as biodiversity hotspots, and the deep water fishery uh, with the highest potential for damage is bottom trawling, uh, similar to the Nico's presentation on uh, the impacts of bottom trawling in shallower water areas, uh, a method of fishing which involves dragging heavy nets and heavy fishing gears along the seabed. But deep sea bottom trawling has been prohibited in Portuguese and Spanish waters around the Azores, Madeira and Canary Islands since the mid 2000s, 2005. And in 2016, the EU adopted a regulation to prohibit bottom trawling below 800 meters in EU waters off mainland Portugal, Spain, as well as France, Ireland, and of course the UK at the time. However, at shallower depths, there are deep sea habitats comprised of corals uh, as well as habitats formed by deep sea sponges and other species all along the European continental margin in the Atlantic that are still vulnerable to bottom fishing. And these are areas which the 2016 deep sea fisheries regulation also requires to be protected. Unfortunately, the protection measures for ecosystems at these depths due to begin in 2018 have not yet been put into place. And we are calling on the parliament as well as the commission and member states to do so as a matter of urgency both to protect these areas which have not been damaged, as well as to allow for restoration of areas which have already been impacted. And this would contribute significantly to implementing the biodiversity strategy. On deep sea bed mining, the nations of the world as members of a UN body called the International Seabed Authority set up under the UN law of the sea will make a decision in the next few years 
on whether to open vast tracts of the international area of the deep ocean to seabed mining. Scientists have warned that biodiversity loss will be inevitable if seabed mining is permitted to occur, and the loss will be permanent over thousands to millions of years, uh, on, including the likelihood that species may be driven extinct before they have been even been discovered. The European Union will play a critical role in the decisions taken by the International Seabed Authority. All EU member states are members of the authority, and seven EU member states, Italy, France, Germany, the Czech Republic, Netherlands, Poland, and Spain are members of the 36 member council of the Seabed Authority, the main decision-making body when it comes to the regulations. At the same time, France, Germany, Belgium, and Poland hold six of the licenses for exploration for mineral resources in the international deep sea issued by the International Seabed Authority to date. And a seventh exploration licenses has been sponsored by a consortium of countries, including Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Bulgaria. So the EU really does sit in a very critical, uh, in a very critical place in which way the International Seabed Authority will go. Altogether, the Seabed Authority has issued 30 licenses to date to explore for minerals covering over 1.3 million square kilometers of seamounts, hydrothermal vents, and deep abyssal plains in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, with more on the way. If even a fraction of these exploration licensed areas are converted to mining areas, these will be by far the biggest mining operations we've seen uh, to date. We, the, the SEC, are calling on a moratorium on the adoption of regulations by the ISA, the Seabed Authority, to allow commercial mining until scientists have had a much better understanding of deep sea species, biodiversity, and ecosystems, and the role they play in planetary processes, such as the sequestration of carbon, as well as the risk posed by mining. The European Parliament in 2018 called for a moratorium on deep sea mining, as have the Fisheries Advisory Councils of the European Union and numerous NGOs such as Seas at Risk, Skiana, Oceana, and others on the call today. Uh, you may have heard one of the MEPs this afternoon stated it's critical that we don't destroy one ecosystem in an effort to rescue another, and this we think applies to the deep sea as well. To conclude, the biodiversity commitments made by the Commission, the heads of state of all member state or the member states, excuse me, of the European Union at the UN Biodiversity Summit in September of 2020 and others need to be turned into effective action. And again, the European Parliament can, should, and already has played a major role, constructive role on this issue, and we're urging it to continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, do, do leave your camera on. Uh, I invite the other speakers to, to turn their cameras on and their microphones. And I will now open the floor for questions from our uh, journalists, our journalist audience. Uh, please don't be shy. <laughs> Just raise your hand or, or turn your... Uh, Simon, please. Personal. Hi, Gonzalo. Oh, sorry. Louis. May I, just a second, please. Yeah, I okay. saw Simon first. Sorry, Luis, if you allow me to wait just a bit, we'll give sure. you the floor right after. What do you got? Go ahead, Simon. Hi, um, this is Simon Pinkstone. I'm a journalist for N0. Um, I had a question, I guess this probably relates mainly to trawling, uh, but potentially of interest to uh, some of the other panelists. Um, what what are the implications for Brexit in terms of North Sea, particular, I mean, in particular of the North Sea um, and biodiversity conservation? Does this complicate your efforts to try and get consensus on um, restricting um, destructive, the most destructive fishing practices? Would like to address. I'd say Nico first, maybe, and then maybe I can come in on that. Thanks for the question. I think. Um, I mean, at this stage, I think, you know, regardless of, of the Brexit situation, most of the member states and the UK on its own, you know, have the competence to, um, you know, to regulate and restrict the most destructive activities. So if, if you mentioned bottom trolling in MPAs, for instance, in marine protected areas, it's, you know, it's, it's a failure of implementation um, and that doesn't really have any, um, you know, 
relation to, to, to Brexit. I mean, now actually Brexit is creating an opportunity. I mean, in the UK, most of the NGOs, as you've probably seen, are calling on, on you know, that momentum for the government to actually implement what they've committed to do. But in terms of the European strategy, um, you know, I, I don't think there's, um, a, you know, a big um, a problem with that. When it comes to, you know, the other idea of restricting bottom trolling in sensitive habitat in coastal areas, same applies, you know, it's essentially what we're asking is now that the parliament take a stance on the strategy and that the commission, you know, starts putting out, you know, this idea of, of banning bottom trolling in coastal areas that already exists, for instance, in the Mediterranean. So in the Mediterranean Sea, and there's a number of countries that also adopted voluntarily restrictions in their coastal areas. Um, so, yeah, we just want to, you know, push that idea of um, restricting these highly unselective and destructive um, fishing gear in sensitive habitats and areas. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't think Brexit is so relevant in that in that respect. But yeah, Matt. Yeah. Now, just quickly on deep sea trawling and deep sea fisheries generally, um, Brexit uh, may actually be be somewhat helpful in the sense that, for example, at the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Committee, a, re a treaty organization that regulates the high seas, deep water fisheries and others in the Northeast Atlantic. Um, uh, it met in November and adopted a prohibition on fishing for orange ruffy, a deep water trawl fishery targeting seamounts in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, that is, you know, uh, a highly unsustainable fishery uh, and had been allowed for the last 10 to 12 years because the voting structure of the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission was such that they couldn't get a sufficient majority needed to pass a prohibition. But the, the UK became an additional member of NEAFC, uh, the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, in October of this year and voted against uh, to prohibit Orange Ruffy uh, fishery in November. And that kind of swung the, uh, the tally in the direction of uh, uh, adopting a prohibition. So, so in that sense, at least, it's, it's, it's actually proven uh, somewhat uh, helpful in terms of international uh, deep sea fisheries conservation measures. Thank you very That's much. really interesting, thanks. Luis, please, and apologies for not spotting you. No, it's okay. Uh, most of all, I think my question is for Rebecca. Um, Rebecca talked about the precaution, precautionary buffers for climate change when setting uh, fishing limits. I would like to ask a few examples how that can be achieved. Thank you for the question, Lewis. Yeah, at the moment, um, ICES provides advice, scientific advice for fishing limits according to uh, maximum sustainable yield for uh, EU member states. Uh, and what we've seen a number of times is, uh, with many stocks actually, is that the predictions of, um, of the impact of the, the catch or the predictions for the improvement of the populations is more ambitious and after the fact they need to be revised down so essentially they're they're anticipating that the populations are going to do better and then after in the following subsequent assessments they realize that they're they're not doing as well and by having uh, precautionary buffers of course this isn't i don't believe this is happening right now is that you would basically be trying to assess the fisheries we, in a much more cautionary manner, because the impact of climate change, of warming waters, potentially acidification on those populations is quite unknown. So it could be that, um, that the scientists might recommend to um, fish below maximum sustainable yield or to try and restore the population numbers to greater size so that they're more resilient and stronger in the face of climate change. So at the moment, it's, it's not being done and exactly how it gets done would be up to the scientists to decide. Um, but that is definitely something that we um, would like to see, particularly because uh, with some populations, as I said, they're not doing as well, even though the catches have been decreased. And okay, thank you, Rebecca, thank you so much. Karen uh, McQuay, please. Oh, hi. Yeah, sorry, my um, camera is not working properly. I just want to ask a really quick question, um, and then I need to hop off. But 
I'd spoken to Rebecca earlier, but um, earlier in the week. <clears throat> but I just wanted to be clear, there's quite a lot in this, um, this 10 point plan, um, and it covers an awful lot of areas. And so I wanted to ask really, it, it seems that what you're saying is that the EU <coughs> member states have failed to achieve any of the, achieve good environmental status, that the laws have not been, have, uh, the laws have not been implemented um, at, at, at the moment. And that this is the op an opportunity for um, the EU to, in its strategy, sort of biodiversity strategy, to to address that. Um, so, um, what do you see as the kind of the most important part of it that they need to do urgently, or is there any, you know, yeah? What what is the most kind of urgent um, action? That is needed is it the implementation of existing laws is it uh you know banning damaging bottom trawling yeah i think every person on this panel might have a different idea of the priority but i think definitely um i mean i don't work on marine protected areas at our fish but definitely uh eliminating destructive fishing from protected areas is an urgent priority I, but I also think that um, there are other priorities such as uh, really taking, uh, it, it, implementing the existing laws to protect mm. species, sensitive species, and to stop overfishing would make massive gains. Um, so th they're, they're probably, I think the three, I, I would say are kind of the three top um, items and then, but the this, but this biodiversity strategy also is an opportunity, I think, for the EU to to really get on the front foot in terms of um, shifting to a more eco like shifting to a more ecosystem based approach to to marine management, but also, I mean, um, potentially, it, this is an opportunity to to put in place some kind of um, some kind of directive that can hold the member states accountable for the uh, uh, implementing these laws because at the moment they're not being implemented and they're just getting away with it. There is absolutely no um, repercussion for the member states for failing to apply these laws. So they can continue polluting the marine environment. They can continue destroying critical ecosystems and they're not being, they're not actually suffering any financial or legal cost for that. So I believe that actually ensuring the do no harm policy um, is, is complied with is a huge opportunity here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we are on the, oh, sorry, you have a follow-up question, Karen. No, 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 I'm good, thank you. So we're on the time that we had um, set aside for this. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add a quick note, any one of the speakers, since we don't have any more questions. If not, I would, oh, Nico, go ahead. Go ahead, Nicola, please. Yeah, no, I think I just wanted to, I think it's a, one of the reasons why we wanted to, to launch this manifesto is but because the parliament starts um, you know, considering the, their opinion. So there are a number of committees that are looking at providing their opinions on this EU biodiversity strategy. Um, the lead committee is the Environment Committee, but uh, there's also the International um, Affairs Committee, the, the, the Fisheries Committee, uh, the Agricultural Committee. So there's a number of, you know, developments in parallel, and we are so we are looking to try to influence as much as possible and raise the ambition uh, of, of the strategy. Um, and we can already see, uh, you know, that there are diverging views, obviously, on on, for instance, whether they should be binding targets and, and issues like this. So it's it's, it's an exciting moment, um, but we hope that in light of the, you know, the, the, the previous resolution, the parliament has already, you know, uh, endorsed the climate and environmental emergency. They've also endorsed a number of resolutions on, on, yeah, on, 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 on biodiversity. So we really um, hope that we can raise the ambition and send a strong signal to, that, you know, ocean matters and, and restoring nature is uh, critical for also achieving the green, the green deal. So. Thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Matt, quick note, 
you know. I think uh, Andrea had a, her hand up as well, but maybe I'll just go quickly just to say that, you know, as NGOs, we take some of the commit the, the commitments that um, the, the science and the commitment seriously that we've been hearing over the last several several years as, as and, and longer, as Rebecca indicated in her introductory remarks. Um, you know, the fact that the International Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services issued a report last year, say, uh, 2019, saying a million species are at risk of extinction over the next several decades is a serious, is a serious issue. Um, and the fact that virtually all, I believe, heads of state, as well as Ursula von der Leyen, um, Boris Johnson, on behalf of the UK, and altogether 79 heads of states, the World Bank and the GEF, all committed in September of 2020 to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. A lot of the actions that need to be taken are going to be have to be taken by the member states, and the parliament is one very, very strong way of holding them accountable to these commitments. And so as NGOs, we feel that the parliamentary process, which often is more open to European citizens than uh, some of the, um, the national-based processes for decision-making, uh, is a really important uh, forum for, for in, in which for us to, to, to work uh, and to act and to, to prod the European Union overall to take these kinds of actions necessary. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Andrea? Yes, very quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to end up in a note saying that we, I wanted to highlight the importance of, of including uh, considerations for ocean conservation in the strategy, because um, sometimes I feel that it's a bit forgotten. And when I watched uh, this afternoon, the debate in the parliament, I really missed uh, hearing much more the world ocean uh, by Europe, uh, by the MEPs. So um, just like a pledge um, and a re reminder of how important ocean, like a healthy ocean is for the conservation of biodiversity overall, how it's even losing biodiversity at a rate higher than at land, and how we really need to work together also with the, you, the press and journalists to, to pass this message on and to, to make sure that we really are able to hold the biodiversity crisis, but without forgetting the important piece of the puzzle, which is uh, the ocean. Thank you very much, Andrea, good point. I will give the floor quickly to Bruna Campos from BirdLife. Uh, she was not a speaker today, but she is uh, one of the many heads that put together uh, the Back to the Source document. Bruna, if you may, you can turn on your camera. Quick. Hi, um, I'm not going to turn on my camera because otherwise my uh, internet is really slow. I'll just want to be very quick because um, one of the things that I think we want to say here is that um, there is a lot of already a lot of evidence to what we're talking about. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we want to flag, especially for journalists who want to read more about it. Um, I just want to to to. Uh, quickly mention one of them, which is related to subsidies. Um, we've been doing a lot of campaigning on subsidies uh, because actually that's one of the biggest impacts we have um, on, uh, on, on the oceans is, you know, these, these impacts that you have, these bottom trawlers, they are getting subsidies, they are being financed. They're actually not lucrative unless they get subsidies. So uh, that's one of the things that we've been talking quite a lot about is sort of just take the money away from these harmful um, harm, harmful impacts from ha these harmful fishing vessels and you probably can do a lot of good already and the other thing is to just put the money where it, where it, it's needed uh, where you can have actually restoration projects you can have um, uh, projects to sort of to help like local communities co-manage uh, marine protected areas and this is also something we've written quite a lot about and there's also a really good document that I, I, I can refer to you as, as turning the tide um, and it just really gives examples of uh, a green recovery of where to put the money to actually achieve all these things that we've listed here. So I just wanted to flag that because um, I think, I mean, um, I think it was Karen, she's not in the call anymore. And she says like, what is the top one? There's so many top things that you can do as Rebecca was saying, but basically starting with the financing where the money is, just don't give the money to the wrong people and give it to the right people. You'll get there much quicker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. I think that wraps, wraps up quite well our session. I don't think anyone else raised their hand. And in any case, we really should be closing. Uh, I think the, 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 the top message is, is start walking the walk and, and, and not only talking the talk. 
Um, we will, of course, the speakers and all of our organizations will be available for follow-up conversations with, with all of you. We will be sending uh, a follow-up email with the recording of this session today, but also additional information, additional documents, and um, also the presentations. Um, and of course, uh, the contacts of our speakers and other NGO representatives that can uh, develop uh, any of the points on the, on the back to the source document. So I would like to thank everyone, starting with the speakers, uh, but also with the journalists that were present, also the NGO colleagues that uh, uh, were listening to us today. And uh, yes, uh, stay safe. And hopefully the spring will, be, will bring the, the start of the end of this pandemic. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and till soon.